So yeah, let's and- talk about amino acids. Like what is an amino acid? People hear that term. Um, what is it? What are amino acids doing? So uh, amino acids are, in the shortest way of describing it possible, they're the building blocks of proteins. They're the smaller components that go together to build a protein in nature. And that's the proteins that we eat. That's the proteins in our body. That's really just proteins in general throughout nature. Uh, I think a helpful way to understand why they're important and how they work is really maybe just do a quick review of protein, which, you know, I think you've done before and your audience might be familiar with, but sometimes it's just good to make sure we're all, you know, aligned. So, uh, Protein is, you know, fundamentally different from the other two macronutrients in our diet because the other two macronutrients, carbohydrates and fat, primarily play this role of energy. So you consume the carbohydrates, you consume the fat, and it gets converted into ATP, which is the the natural, it's the, the, uh, the energy currency of our body. Protein can be used for that, but it's not its primary purpose. Uh, And it may be a helpful way of thinking about this is if we compare our bodies to, say, a house, like to run the energy in your house right now, you either are buying electricity electricity from the grid or you have solar panels, et cetera, and you actually get that energy into your house and what allows you to have the lights on and run this computer and run the dishwasher, et cetera. But there's another major component of your house that it's built. Like your house is built of all these different materials. You've got hardwood floors, maybe. You got the shelves behind. I see you. That uh, the shelves behind you that I see, and so all of these materials are actually closer, more closely related to what protein does in our body. The reason why we eat protein is because we're made of protein, and we have to rebuild that protein. And so when I say we're made of protein, just giving an idea what this is like. Oftentimes, people are familiar with the idea that over 50% of our body is water, and it's actually higher. It could be 58, 65%, depending on our gender and age. But of the part that's solid mass, so that's all of our, like, the, parts of that, the part of us that's solid mass, over 50% of that is made up of proteins. That's things like all of our vital organs, our skin, our hair, our nails, our lean muscle. But it's also things that maybe we don't think about as solid materials, like enzymes. Enzymes are made up of proteins. Um, hormones, neurotransmitters, the, the chemical messengers in our brain are actually the metabolites of these proteins. So all of these proteins in our body similar to the pieces of our house, don't just last forever. They actually get, they, they get old and they get used to a point where maybe you need to replace them. So for example, if you put in a new door in your house and you open and shut that door every day, you know, over and over and over again, after a while, maybe the hinges start to wear out or you walk through a certain part of your house, the hardwood floor starts to give out and you need to replace those raw materials. Well, similarly, every single protein in our body has a certain half-life. That protein is functional for a certain amount of time. And if I just, I'm looking at my arm right now and I see my skin, it's made up of millions of proteins. Well, each one of those individual little proteins after a certain point in time is not functional to the full degree that it wants to be functional. And what happens is that little individual protein actually breaks apart. That's called protein breakdown. And when it breaks apart, what you notice, coming back to amino acids, is that it's made up of these individual amino acids. And there's 20 of them that form the proteins that actually make up solid, you know, solid tissues and mass in our body. And of those, some of them are actually still good, similar. Maybe like you're walking through your house, the hardwood floors need to be replaced. Some of the boards are still good. You could reuse them. Some of them are like, they're junk. You got to throw them out. Similarly, some of these amino acids are like, they're, they're too old. You can't be, they can't be used. So they get converted to urea and you pee them out. Some of the amino acids are actually still good and they can be used to rebuild that protein in the skin that actually makes up your skin tissue. But immediately what you notice is, well, some of them are gone and some of them are left. How do I get more amino acids to, you know, to, to rebuild that skin tissue? That is why we eat protein. When we eat protein, whether it comes from plants or animals, we digest the protein in our body. It breaks apart the protein into these little amino acids that actually make it up. The amino acids go into our blood and they get distributed throughout our body to help rebuild all of these proteins in our body. So that I think is rather than just saying like, hey, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Hopefully that gives Mm -hmm. the picture of why it is so fundamental to get amino acids in our diet 
because if we don't, we literally don't have the, the raw material to help rebuild our body, which is pretty fundamentally different from, say, why we need to make sure we eat carbohydrates or fat. They play different roles for um, energy metabolism in the body. Yeah, it's a great explanation. And <clears throat> so protein obviously is is super key and really important, obviously, for building muscle, for lean body tissue overall, for bone tissue, for helping our body produce the right hormones, <clears throat> anabolic hormones like testosterone, for example, estrogen, progesterone. So, so many important reasons to have protein. Are people consuming in our society, are they consuming enough protein these days? And are there problems, even if somebody is consuming protein? Are they having issues with getting enough of these amino acids? Because you got to break it down and digest it effectively. Yeah, so I think there's two really uh, good questions within what you just asked. Um, one is, are we eating enough of the protein? And the second question is kind of related to it. It's like, well, is there a certain type of protein maybe that's more helpful for us? Mm. And so what I would just name is that when we consume this protein and we're trying to get these amino acids from it, there's actually certain amino acids that are more important than others, specifically for something called protein synthesis, for stimulating new protein synthesis. So when I described earlier that, hey, there's always this amount of breakdown in the body. There's old proteins, they're breaking down, they need to be rebuilt. That idea of rebuilding them, the idea of building new proteins is called protein synthesis. And the amino acids that actually contribute to protein synthesis that stimulate new protein synthesis are essential amino acids. Oftentimes when you hear about essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids, we're comparing um, plant proteins and animal proteins and we're just saying, hey, essential are the ones that you have to eat, which is true. Like essential amino acids are the type of amino acids in protein that your body cannot synthesize. If you actually consume the essential ones, your body can synthesize the non-essential ones. That doesn't mean you want to force your body to do it, but you don't have to eat the non-essential ones. But the other big component is that the essential amino acids actually stimulate new protein synthesis. The non-essential do not at all. And there's very clear studies demonstrating consumption of only essential, a combination of both, or only the non-essential. And it's very clear the essential amino acids stimulate all of the protein synthesis. Then the next question is, okay, well, am I eating foods that are rich, like the proteins that I'm eating? Do they have mm -hmm. all of these essential amino acids in them? Can I digest them? Is it rich in them, etc.? Let's just assume that you're eating the best proteins, right? Like you're eating the most high quality proteins and we can go into yeah. which ones those are, but let's just say we're consuming enough of them. The RDA, which is considered the recommended daily allowance, I would recategorize that with the protein science that has emerged over the last 30 to 40 years, that it's really like the bare minimum. This is the minimum amount of protein that you'd want to eat, not to have like robust lean muscle and be like a good athlete or to live vibrantly, but to like not have uh, unnecessary hair loss, to not have hormone dysfunction, to not have significant issues is approximately 0.4 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So if I weigh 100 pounds, that's 40 grams of protein today. If I weigh 150 pounds, that's 60 grams of protein per day. That's like the bare, bare minimum of very high quality protein you would need to be eating. What I would say, though, is like also when we give that number, that bare minimum number, you're really talking about a younger population. And we can get more into mm -hmm. this a little bit later. But as you get older, you necessarily need more protein and or higher quality protein because you need more essential amino acids than that younger person needs because you simply do not utilize them as well as you did before. So I think you just have to ask yourself, am I absolutely getting that bare minimum of the 0.4 grams of protein? Most people are probably getting that amount. Then the question is, well, what's an ideal amount of protein per day? Mm. And there's a lot of different science on this, but let's just say that the audience that's listening to this is an audience that is more interested in like living the best mm -hmm. life, living a more optimized mm -hmm. life to be healthy, be active, live a longer time. The guidelines for that are going to be closer to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. And it could depend on your age, on how active you are, but let's just, for simple, for simplicity's sake. So that's over double the amount of the 0.4 grams. That's 100 mm -hmm. grams of protein if you weigh 100 pounds, 150 grams of protein per day if you weigh 150 pounds. I would say most people are not consuming that. 
it, it you you have yeah. to be very protein centric in your diet. You have to be really, you know, I'm honestly focused on like protein and other whole and then whole fruits and vegetables because you start yeah. eating, you know, uh, more like calorie dense carbohydrates, ca- carbohydrates or super uh, calorie dense fats. Like you're just gonna be eating too many calories. So you have to be very strategic and thoughtful. So what I would say is, um, yeah, most people are probably. Um, if you're aware of that, you know, like you got to work <laughs> to get that in. And if you're not aware, I'd encourage people to re- you know, to track your macros for a week and see how much protein are you really eating, but because you're probably not quite in that space. Um, and again, that's all saying like that you're eating and all of these proteins are like the most high quality proteins. Uh, so do, do you think that answered the question? Yeah, I think so. And, and by high quality proteins, you know, there's a difference between plant proteins and animal proteins. Most of the plant proteins out there, like the protein you find in in legumes, it's not complete protein. Now it can be balanced with, you know, like something, for example, like rice and beans. Rice will provide a couple of the amino acids that bean doesn't have, and that will create a complete protein. But in general, there's a lot of these proteins that are incomplete. And then also it comes down to, like you mentioned, some of these muscle building amino acids, like the branch chain amino acids, like such as leucine, isoleucine, valine, and leucine in particular, uh, when it comes to muscle development, some proteins are higher in leucine content, which like you said, one of the main main keys with your amino acid content is stimulating muscle protein synthesis. And so if you're eating a lower leucine protein in it you know we we can go into obviously into that as well like for example collagen protein which is very common in our society you know a lot of people um i'm sure a lot of my listeners are are using collagen protein and there there are benefits to using collagen protein but not when it comes to muscle protein synthesis because it's so low in leucine levels and so quality of the protein is 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 really key and so what are the best quality proteins I'm glad that you mentioned all that. It's a great, I think, intro into this this subject. So, a quality protein is defined by a few things. One is what are the what's the amino acid composition? And the first question would be is does it have all of the essential amino acids? Mm-hmm. So there are nine essential amino acids. And when I say does it have all of them, like you can have trace amounts and things like legumes, but not a significant enough amount to actually be considered a complete protein. So does it have all nine of the essential amino acids? All animal proteins, not all animal proteins, but all traditional animal protein food sources do. So that includes dairy, eggs, chicken, beef, pork, fish, etc. Things that are kind of um, an accessory to that, like collagen, which is a protein that comes from an animal, is actually not a complete protein. It doesn't have a significant enough amount of tryptophan in it. So it's not a complete protein. It doesn't have mm-hmm. all nine essential amino acids. So it does not count in this idea of hitting those daily uh, protein requirements if you're just eating it on your own. But another really important factor, and this is especially true for plant proteins, is how digestible is the protein? And I think this is sometimes confusing for people because mm. they think, well, if I eat this food, like I like the way my tummy feels, you know, and they think that means it's they're digesting it well. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is the actual like biochemical nature of that protein and how it's bound together and what encapsulates it. How does my how does the human body actually break apart that protein and how capable is it to absorb the amino acids in the protein? And fundamentally, plant proteins are significantly less digestible than animal proteins. So this, you could have this, you could have an equal amount, you could have way more legumes that have a that have the same amount of total amino acid content in them, or the same amount of protein content as a piece of beef. But you will get way more of the of the essential amino acids and the amino acids in general out of that beef than you will out of the beans because your body simply can't digest and get the amino acids out of the protein. So that's another really important factor. And then, kind of jumping back to this essential amino acid component is, um, yeah, which amino acids are in it? The, which essential amino acids? Are there certain higher amounts? And it is true that the branch chain amino acids play an important role in stimulating protein synthesis. And it's not just muscle protein synthesis, it's also whole body protein mm-hmm. synthesis. So oftentimes I think people people think about like, oh, leucine and isoleucine and valine and actually lysine plays a really big role in this as well, that they're the things that are gonna help me like build and maintain muscle. They're also the things that stimulate protein synthesis across the whole mm-hmm. body. 
So um, it's not just for muscle. It's actually for the idea of when you consume this protein source and you get these, you get these essential amino acids in your body on their own, outside of a factor of actually including, say, resistance training, do they stimulate new protein synthesis? Do they encourage the body on its own as like a nutraceutical to actually communicate to the body to build new proteins? And when you have higher amounts of the leucine, the isoleucine, the valine, and the lysine, they do that to a much more significant amount. Where we've seen when you say spike whey protein with an additional amount, when you increase the leucine and whey protein, which is typically like, I think 25, 30% to the 40%, it has like 50% more protein synthesis that it generates. So slightly tweaking the amino acid content of foods or eating foods that are higher have a significant impact. So what I would say across the board is most animal proteins, well, actually all animal proteins of traditional food sources are high quality proteins. If you wanna be more in a plant-based direction, the ones that tend to be, they're all going to have difficulty with digestion, but the ones that have, that are complete proteins, meaning they have all nine essential and they have better profiles are things like soy, buckwheat, quinoa. Like those, like those are the kind of the standouts. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, and you have to evaluate them for other reasons. Like, do I like those foods do, do, in general? Do they agree with my digestion, et cetera? But those are ones to focus on. Otherwise you need to do, you need to think more about plant combining actually combining beans and rice, you know, combining wheat bread with peanut butter, you know, like you combine these yeah. things and they actually, they make this complete protein.